when quizzes are open, no. In class, when you get practice quizzes that look just like it, and you get to just basically, I need to do that quiz probably in front of me, just like these three quiz preps that we've done in class. You know, follow the recipe. Now you have it as a take home. Follow the recipe. If you don't, do it for yourself. Oh, it's a take home. I will just do whatever. desperation dictates and you don't learn anything by doing it you just missed an opportunity that's not about the points it's about learning the process even if it takes you three hours to do this take home quiz the test has got a lot more stuff on it. and the test is not going to be a take home So do, you're here to get something out of this class. I mean, you're, you're obviously putting in the time for taking the program, and then right afterwards, you got to spend all day with me twice a week. But get something out of it. Get something out of it. Don't cheat yourself by just, I'm, I'm going to get the points. Substitute. So, zero it is zero on the first piece, second piece, or third piece. Where is zero? So, this is what we're talking about. If I look at that as a number line, okay, our number line, our functions are divided up into these pieces. For all the x's less than negative seven. So over here, we have negative seven. Okay, and there's an open circle for all the x's that are less than negative seven. Negative seven. We're going to plug stuff into j of x equals two thirds x minus four. That's the function for this side. J of X is equal to two thirds X minus four. But then when we have negative seven less than or equal to, we got equal, negative seven less than or equal to X, which is less than four. So look at the X, it's between negative seven and it's between the four. For all the x's between negative 7 and 4 and equal to the negative 7, we're going to substitute those values into 3 minus x squared. So between this negative 7 and over here, this 4, and you know what? I don't want to put circles. This is just here's the negative 7, here's the 4. So for all the x's that are between negative seven less than or equal to the x, but less than the four, we're gonna plug it into j of x equal to three minus x squared. We substitute it in this piece. And then we're going from left to right, then here's the four. Four, for all the x's greater than four equal to four, on the right side of four, j of x is going to use this piece. Negative six x plus one. <clears throat> when you're deciding what piece to plug it into, we're plugging in zero. X is zero. So where is zero? Is it less than negative seven between negative seven and four or greater than or equal to four? Between. Yeah. Zero is between negative seven and four. So zero is going to go into the middle piece. I put zero into this piece only. When X is between negative seven and four, 
when X is one of these values, I plug into that piece of function. That's how it's defined. So J is zero. And I want to, when you do your quiz, I want to see the substitution, then the simplification. So it's going to be J of zero equals three minus, I know you can do it in your head, three minus zero squared. J zero is three minus zero, so J of zero equals three. But doesn't it equal x is bigger than x? If x is between these two numbers, it only goes here. Okay. So if I'm plugging in a so if I'm plugging in a number and it is in between, it has to here's the word and. Negative seven is less than or equal to x, and at the same time, x has to be less than a four. So zero, okay, is at the same time greater than negative seven and less than four. So zero is only on this interval. This is going to be used only if zero is greater than a four. This is only going to be used if zero is if x is less than a negative seven. Oh, zero is only in here. So if you look at the number line, the, the cutoffs, the, the property divisions where the, the, the fences between the intervals, this function only works up to here. Then in between here and here, it's only this <laughs> function. And then after four, it's only that function. You can't plug it into more than one piece. Because if I could plug zero into this one and this one at the same time, then I would have two different answers for zero, then it's not a function. Zero can only happen once as an x value. Okay? And that is a really good question because I, as all students, will put, will put zero to all three of them. So they're ignoring this. This is the condition. So when I'm plugging in a number, when, when do I use this one? If I'm trying to plug in something less than negative seven. When do I use the middle one? If I'm plugging in a number between negative seven and a four, or equal to the negative seven. When do I use this one? If I'm plugging in a number that's greater than or equal to the four. So what am I plugging in? I'm plugging in something that here, eight. Where is eight? Is it less than negative seven in between negative seven and four or bigger than four? So it's only going to go into the third piece. So doing what you did right up there mm -hmm. will show us or the, the person where it's plugged in other than doing what you probably do not have about zero and all of them. So that helps out. Yeah, because you're only allowed to plug it into one piece. It can only go into one piece. And that's why the function is defined by three separate pieces based on these restrictions. Now, a piecewise function. Remember, we're, we're, we're learning the basics of how math works in the real world. How when am I when would I ever use it? First of all, we're here. When do we really use this stuff? It, life is a lot more complicated than what we learn. We're trying to build the foundation with what we can actually apply life to. Life is not a nice, always the same function. We've simplified a lot of things. You know what? How much is the long distance call these days? You don't even know anymore, do you? You even think about it. You'll call a friend and... and New York, and you talk forever. Back in the 80s, it was, I don't know, dollars fifteen dollar eighty for the first minute. And then it was like 12 cents for each additional minute. That's a piecewise function. From zero seconds to 60 seconds, it was a dollar fifty no matter what. For the first minute. 
And then from 60 seconds, 61 seconds, to 119, 120 seconds, it's another 15 cents. So if I, if I talk for 61 seconds, they're going to charge me for the whole minute. Or if I talk for the whole 119 seconds, they're going to charge. So it's a, it's a piecewise function. So they only, so they're not going to like have a slope like this. It's just going to be 15, another 15 cents, then another 15 cents, then another 15 cents. And it would just accrue 15 cents for every minute. Piecewise function. When you want to calculate the velocity necessary for the speed of sound, when they broke the sound barrier back in 1947, with John Yeager, and the Bell X1 glamorous lens. The speed of sound is based upon the uh, altitude, air pressure. The, the thicker, the, the, the more dense the air is, the more dense the medium that sound can travel through, the faster sound will travel. Because sound is a vibration. It's a sound wave. When you hear my voice, my vocal cord, my vocal cords are vibrating. And it vibrates the molecules in the air. And it vibrates these sound waves. They get to your ear. They vibrate your tympanic membrane. Sends a signal to your brain. Interrupts it into sound. But it has to propagate through air. It has to propagate through the sound waves through the air. Now, if I try to, it will travel faster through the wall. It'll be muffled because it'll get diffused. But it will travel faster through the wall because the, the wall is really dense. All those molecules are really packed together. Sound travels faster through the water because the molecules are really dense. So there, there's more molecules to uh, for the sound of travel more quickly. Air is spread out, so the molecules are a little less dense. So the, the less the, the uh, lower the density, the, the slower sound will travel. So when you're here at about sea level, sound will travel about 720 miles per hour. The higher you go, the thinner the air is, the atmosphere is. Sound travels slower. What do they say? The, the whole tagline of the movie Alien. In space, no one can, can hear you scream. Because in space, there's no air. It's a vacuum. If there's no air, sound won't travel. So whenever they show you a science fiction movie, and there's an explosion, and you can hear the explosion, that's bullshit. <laughs> you can't hear it. Now, if you're inside the ship, yeah, because there's still air in there, you can hear if you're inside. But if you're the outside, there's sound can't travel. So the higher you go, the slower sound will travel. So when they broke the sound barrier, what they would do is they would take this little rocket plane, because again, we're barely learning how to fly jets. And you couldn't waste all the fuel trying to get it up into up in the sky. So they would fly it on the wing of a bomber, you know, big, big, big bomber, fly it up to a really high altitude where the air is really, really thin. So sound is traveling really slow at about 620, 630 miles per hour. So from 750, 720 to about 630. You don't have to go as fast. And then he would, you know, Chuck Gager, they'd just drop the plane and he would kick on the jet engines. And they didn't know what they were going to experience. Because everybody got close to breaking sound barrier, it would explode. The buffeting of the, of the vibrations of the sound waves destroyed and just basically disintegrated their planes. So they thought the sound barrier was like this big wall of, in the sky that you couldn't break through. What it was is just as you as that plane is traveling through the sound, vibrations are ahead of it, the sound waves are ahead of it, going faster than the plane itself. But as the plane speeds up, now it's catching up to its own sound. 
So what happens is you get closer to your own sound, those sound waves are crashing in on your own plane. And that's what disintegrate all those good old plane factors. What they did was they made the wing stand a little smaller. They made it more like a bullet. And what happened was as Chuck Yeager went through here and burst through the sound barrier, these sound waves crashed in on each other and they heard a big explosion. What's that called? Sonic boom. First time they ever heard a sonic boom, and everybody thought he was dead. Next thing you hear, he's on the radio, he's on, you know, look, I think I broke the old moth meter because I'm not like Mach 1.2, which is 1.2 times sound clouds being sound. 1947. Right now I'm watching the uh, from the Earth to the Moon. It's a mini series that was on HBO back in 1999. Chronicle of the Apollo missions. It's like a documentary series by Tom Hanks, but it's a, it's a drama documentary, so it's really interesting how far the all the sacrifices have had to be. It's really, really interesting being the history of that. But Where I was getting at is the uh, speed of sound is a piece is a is a piecewise function. The velocity or speed of sound is with respect to the altitude. So, however the altitude is, you have like multiple functions based upon the altitude because it changes based upon how far above. See, look, the higher you go, the less of the output, the uh, lesser of the uh, speed of sound. There is a really good, I can't remember what Discovery Channel or what. Uh, they were trying forever to build a car that could break the sound. You know, the salt pots of uh, uh, Utah. And the problem is, if you're on the ground, you got to go 750 miles an hour. So they're building the rocket building you know, little jet cars. And I think I believe they did. But those things are ugly. You know, basically you put a jet engine on a car. And nobody's gonna insure the ground. I'll say no, they want no. Nobody wants anything from doing. But the point is. What we're learning here is the pieces that are necessary. What am I going to use this? Life is life doesn't come ready. Life is peaceful, piecewise function. Life is fraction. Life is everything that we're trying to get to be able to get. If you want to actually be able to apply. Yeah. So I get the last Um so all three of those functions, this is confirmation. If I were to write out a number line ahead of time, they're always going to cohesively work together. And that's the problem itself. You're trying to find where on that number line that your problem's fitting into all three of those. So I'm given a number eight. Which part of the number line is eight going to be on? Over here, greater than four. So which piece of the function do I plug it into? I plug it into this piece. Now, I, I don't think I ever drew this out before. I know I didn't do it last year, but I always went over here. So where's the eight? Is eight less than negative seven? Is eight in between negative seven and four? No, no. Is eight bigger than or equal to negative four? Or positive four? Yeah. So we're going to plug eight into that third piece. And last question. Yeah. So using your sound barrier. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, example here. So let's just say you're on the mat. So let's just say that these equations are going to it will show you how high and you're trying to plug that in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and so the speed of sound at this altitude of eight okay. would be plug it into this one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So when we plug in eight, it's negative six times x. So that's going to be j of eight is now negative six times the eight. Show the substitution and then plus one. So j of eight is negative 48 plus one. So j of eight, negative 47. Substitute, simplify.
Now, you cannot panic just because you see a fraction. First thing you start with is show the substitution. Maybe it's going to work out nicely. Show the substitution. Negative 12. Where's negative 12 in the first, second, or third piece? In the first piece. Negative 12 is to the left of negative 7. Negative 12 is over here. So negative 12 is going to go to this first piece. So J of negative 12, show the substitution. Everybody can just do this. When I plug in negative 12, I'm going to get two-thirds times X is now a negative 12, and then minus 4. That's how you start. That's how you start, just substitute it. And then we'll go from there. Don't panic just because there's a fraction involved. Just start there. Okay, negative 12. I haven't done anything but plug it in. And then one thing at a time. You know you have to multiply. That's a positive times a negative, so it's going to be. It's going to be a negative. You take care of that. And then we're multiplying two-thirds times a 12. So, 3 goes into 12 four times. It simplifies. It reduces. So, I have a 2 times 4, so it's a negative 8. And then minus a 4. Substitute and simplify. And you won't see that simplification if you don't substitute it first. And now negative 8 minus 4, J okay, of negative 12 is negative 12. And oh my gosh, negative 33 over 2. I'm out. I'm out so. But you, you can't panic. Yeah, you first have to figure out what piece you're going to plug it into. Don't guess. Negative 33 over 2 is a number. We just got to figure out what interval negative 3 over 32 is actually going to be in. First of all, we know it's not bigger than 4. It's a negative number. So please don't plug it into the third piece. But negative 33 over 2, no decimals. However, nobody said you can look at it as a decimal to see which where it's going to fit. So negative 33 over 2, what's that for 33? Good, 16 and a half, 16.5. <laughs> Oh, so negative 16.5. Is it less than negative 7 or between negative 7 and 4? Less than negative 7. So I know I'm going to plug it into the first piece. I just need to know which one I'm going to plug it into. I'm not going to plug in the decimal. I just need to know which one am I going to plug it into. Where does it go? Do you remember the math problems where you would be given a whole bunch of numbers, you had to put them in the right order, and have fractions in them and decimals and all that? Well, if you could, if you knew what they all were in decimal, probably could arrange them a lot easier than looking at a whole bunch of fractions. But they didn't use a calculator to have a good idea, a decent idea of what those might be as a decimal first place. Nobody's saying you can't use a calculator either. So if you didn't know what 33 over 2 was as a decimal, half of, 30, half of 33, punch it up on a calculator. 33 divided by 2, 16.5. Okay. But again, no decimals in your answers. You got to show the fractional work. I just want to know where it's going to go. So it's going to be in the first piece J of negative 33 over 2. Yep. 
is equal to two-thirds times the negative 33 over 2 and then we're going to take away 4. So j of negative 33 over 2 we have a positive times a negative, so what's that going to be? It's going to be a negative. When you multiply fraction, reduce if you can. Two goes into two and reduces completely. And then this denominator is a three, that numerator is a 33. How many times can this three go into that 33? 11 times. So the 2 and this 3, they both reduce, so that's 1 over 1 times 11 over 1. So it's just negative 11 minus 4. Negative 11 minus 4 is negative 15. So number five, we actually want to plug into four. X is well, four is not less than negative seven. Negative seven is less than or equal to X, which is less than four. So if I actually want to plug four in, does four fit in this interval? No, because this is for all the X's that are less than four. Four is not less than itself, so it's not here. The third piece, if I'm trying to use an x that is greater than or here's the equal to four. So if I actually want to plug in the value of four, I have to find the from or the interval that has the equal to four. So it's this third piece where we have the equal to four. So it's going to be j four equal to negative six times x to the four and then plus one. Negative 24, now plus 1, negative 4 is equal to negative 23. Now I want to plug in the negative 7. Well, negative 7 is one of those interval defining numbers. It separates one interval from another. So it separates one piece from another piece. So who has the equals? The first piece or the second piece or the third piece or the seventh? Negative. The negative side. Yeah. The second piece owns the second piece owns the negative seven. They have the equals on the negative seven. So if I plug in negative seven, I'm going to plug it into this second piece. Okay, be careful here. J of negative 7 is equal to whatever goes in, it's 3 minus, and I'm plugging in negative 7, and then I'm going to square it. So parentheses, negative 7, and then you're going to square it. I, you got to show me the substitution. You have to show me the substitution. And then we should J of negative 7 is this 3 minus what is negative 7 squared? It would be 9. J of negative 7 is negative 46.
Any questions on this? Number six. Number seven. 24 over 5. So where's that? Okay. Which one? On the top one? So we need the first one? It's a positive number. Since it's a positive number, it cannot be less than negative 7. So maybe it's between negative 7 and positive 4 or greater than 4. How many times can 5 go into 24 even? 4.4, actually 4.8. Oh. But in more than 4. 5 goes into 24 at least 4 times. And then you have a remainder. Okay, you have a remainder. So it's bigger than four. 24 or five is bigger than four. If it's bigger than four, it goes into this piece. Okay. But you can always check, you know, no one's, no one's going to tell 24 divided by five is equal to 4.8. And 4.8 is for the right of 4, so it's going to go into the third piece. So now I plug it in. J of 24 over 5 is equal to negative 6 times X is 24 over 5, and then plus 1. Okay. That's it. I don't know. I've never been the same. Don't panic just because there are fractions. Just show the substitution. Okay. If you panic just because of the side of a fraction, you won't get past the first step. Is basically one of the most important things I'm going to be looking for. Did you at least do the substitution? Because from here, it's just arithmetic. Here, we're just going to be adding these things together. Order of operation: substitute, simplify. It's order of operation. J of 24 over 5. A negative times a positive is going to be a negative. Is anything going to reduce? Can I reduce the 6 and the 5? No, they don't have anything in common. So I actually have to multiply these together. 6 times 24 is 100, 148 over 5. So when I multiply that 6 times 24 over 5, remember 6 over 1 times 24 over 5. So 6 times the 24 over the 1 times 5. 6 times 24 is 148. All right, 144. 144. Yeah. Now I actually going to combine two fractions together. What adding fractions again? It's arithmetic. So if I'm, going, if I'm going to combine these two fractions together, I need a common denominator. It's a negative. Don't lose that negative. This is a 5. That's just a 1. So what would the common denominator need to be? 5. Be a 5. The good news, that's already ready to go. Leave it alone. 144, 5. And we're just going to change this one into five over five. That's the same as the one. Right now it's one over one. So I multiply by five over five to make it into a common denominator. And I keep emphasizing, don't forget that this is a negative. 
because that next step would be add or subtract the numerator. In the numerator, you have a negative 144, this one, plus a 5, all over this single 5. It's a negative 144 and then a positive 5, so that's a negative 139 all over 5. But if you ignore, forget, leave off the negative on the 144, that's going to mess it up. You got to keep track of yourself. Like keep them for it. Spell to do just and Five over two. Where is five over two? With the first, second, or third piece? What's half of five? Two point five. So where's two point five? The first, second, or third piece? In the second piece. Okay. Two point five is in between negative seven and a four. So 2.5, 502 is going to go into 3 minus x squared. So you look here, 3 minus parentheses, 5 over 2 is going to get squared. That's all you need to do first. Show that substitution. Now it's order of operation. We have to do the exponent before we do subtraction. So j of 5 over 2 is equal to 3 minus 5 over 2 squared is 25 over 4. There. Now we're combining two fractions again. And okay, so order of operations, we have a common denominator. J of 5 over 2 is equal to it's a fraction. This is 3 over 1. So what's the common denominator between the one and four? Four. That's the only denominator I have to work with, so it has to be four. So if I'm going to change that one into a four, you multiply by four over four. So the three becomes 12 over four. And don't change the 25 to a 4 because it's down. You don't know. Then, you don't have to show this step. I'm just showing you how to get to the last part. You add or subtract the numerator. So 12 minus 25. all over the common denominator, but you can just do this, 12 minus 25, so positive 12 take away at 25, would be a negative 13 over four. Leave it as an improper fraction. Make sure it's reduced to those terms. 13 and four don't have a common factor, so that's simplified. Don't try to change it to a mixed number. Because you have the right answer, if you make a mistake changing it to a mixed number, you just messed up your right answer. And again, the directions are going to say, unless the question said, hey, I want decimals in me. Follow the right. <laughs>
Any questions there? And negative eight. Where is negative eight little? In the first place. It's less than negative seven. Two thirds times x is now two thirds times negative eight. And then we're going to take away a four. J of negative eight. You know, and oh, I, I, I hope it would reduce, but it doesn't simplify. And I'm doing these on purpose because I want you to practice with the fractionals, dealing with the fractions. So there's nothing I can use. A positive times a negative, negative. This is two over three times eight over one. So I get negative 16 over three, and then a minus four. So we're going to get some denominator from getting it. So. Don't forget, this fraction is a negative, and we're subtracting. 16 over 3, this is a 4 over 1. What's the common denominator coming from? 3. You're three. Which is good because that's already got the three we want. So we don't change that one. But this one we have to multiply by three over three. Four times three is 12. So this fraction is now 12 over three. Now they have common denominators. Negative 16 over 3 minus 12 over 3 is negative 28 over 3. Negative 16 thirds minus 12 thirds. I got, I got negative 16 of these thirds. I got negative 16 of them. And then I got another negative 12 of these thirds. So negative 16 of those thirds and another negative 12 of those thirds. Make total of negative 28 of those thirds. Okay. What I've been doing over here is you add or subtract the numerators, keep the denominator. So what I did was it's a negative 16, and then you take away the 12 all over the three. Okay. Now, what we have to do with 1.4 still is we have to graph something like this. Not a three piece on the test. Actually, let me just go ahead and provide the spoiler alerts. You don't have to graph anything mandatory on the test. That's what I thought. The graphing is going to be a book of choice. So this is this is a little uh, foreshadowing for one point five. So you'd be given a function, and a, b, c, or d. Which one is it? Okay. This actually goes back to the first week of class. We went over the parent function. Absolute value is what shape? 
What shape is an absolute value of it? So it's a V-shape. Absolute value is always a V-shape. So if I'm graphing the absolute value function, it has to be a V-shape. So A is out, B is out. Can't be those two. So why would this is process of elimination? So it has to be either C or D. In 1.5, we figure out how to tell which one it is. Then we did parent functions for square roots. And then Fred Penn said, well, by a nice coincidence, the graph of the square root function, it starts at a single point and then goes up to the right, looks a little bit like the square root sign. The radical sign and the, the graph of itself looks, they look very similar to each other. Okay. So, multiple choice, square root of 3x minus 4. Well, that's not a square root of that. So it's either this one or this one. So that goes that way. This one flipped upside down. There's some ways to flip things upside down. From when we're not getting there. But there's only two possibilities that could possibly work here. And then you have this x squared. We said x squared quadratic is always going to be a parabolic shape. Well, that's a square root function. That's an absolute value function. So these are the only two that are parabolics, parabolas. So there's a reason why this one would be shifted to the right and up, or this one shifted left and up. So it must have something to do with the five and the three. So again, that's 1.5. But then getting to what does occur here, here the T swap. You don't have to graph on your test a piecewise function by hand. Bonus question, yes. I've been, I've been giving all sorts of these could be bonus questions. So I've been given a long list. I can't give that many bonus questions. But I've made some remarks throughout the whole last three or four weeks. What would possibly happen? What number is that? Positive one, right? Over here. What number is this? So you see how you have this piece that stops at negative one and starts here at negative one? Could it be A? No, because this one's starting and stopping at negative one. We're using negative one. Over here, here's positive one. Positive one, and there, this one goes all the way up to positive one, and this one over here starts with positive. Maybe it's B. Over here, this one goes all the way up to positive one, and this one starts with positive one. B, again, we're back with the negative one. That's not negative one. This is, that's positive one. So it can't be A, it can't be B. You don't guess. You gotta be like a detective. What are your clues? You don't actually have to graph it yourself. You can just kind of eliminate what you didn't. Can't be. So it can't be A or D because those are using negative ones. This one goes to one and then starts at one. Now, they're very similar. This one's going down here. That's a one negative five, and that's a one negative five. Over here, that's a one positive three, and over here, that's a one pop. 
It's exactly the same graph, which is the only thing that's different. The circles. Over here, that's a solid circle. But up there, it's an open circle. This one has an open, goes to the right, down to the solid, goes to the right. You see now you have no equals and no equals. Less than one greater than or equal to one. So here's the one. Who owns the one? Greater than or less than? Who has the equal? Greater than or less than? Greater than. So greater than to the right. They own the one. They have the solid circle at the one. When X is greater than or equal to one, we have a solid circle. This is it. Okay. That's how you tell the difference. So we'll learn how to graph that by hand. But I mean, it has be multiple choice. In between uh, now and 10 o'clock, sorry, at the end of class, at 1030 or so, or sorry, 1130 or so, I'll go over any more quiz prep questions you might want to see. So a little more organized at it, and we're not just sitting here pulling our thumbs, you know, going through the hole. All right, which ones you want to see? And waiting, waiting. This is your request hotline. Which prep, which prep, which prep? Which quiz prep do you want to see? Is it the first quiz prep for one three, second quiz prep for one three, or the third one? And then which question? So if you wanted to see uh, the second quiz prep, and then question one uh, B. Okay. Tell me which quiz prep it's from and which problem it's from. Uh, that's that way. It's a little more hard. And if you weren't here Tuesday, we went over every single type of quiz question you could possibly get randomly as you take on quiz. Okay, so Tuesday's co rec video is really good companion to your take on quiz. That's all I'm saying. All right, back to tips.